and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. I thought it would be a good idea to put together all of series one into one video. That way, especially for those of you who are new, you'll get caught up really quick and you'll be prepared for this Friday the 13th when I upload the first video for series two. My spirit of choice tonight while watching myself talk about spirits is a berry lemon sour vodka that I got from an old high school buddy of mine. Thanks, Pat. It's not quite full because I've already shot this twice and had some technical issues. So this is my third. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. 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 I think I should tell you why I'm starting this series out in a tent. One, because ghost stories are best told camping. And two, I don't really want to be talking about this stuff in my house. The last house I lived in, I was certain that something had followed me back from my childhood home and was wreaking havoc there. Um, I'll get into those stories in some later episodes. For this first video, I'd like to start with the most recent and it's one that has really pushed me into doing this uh, video series. I wanted to document everything that's taken place there up till now and beyond. So in 1976, my dad completed the house he'd been working on. He built it from the ground up. He designed it. So the history of the house has always just been our families. And although my grandmother, my mother, and my father have all passed away in the house, Weird, unexplained events have been happening long before this. So at the end of August, beginning of September of 2019, my nephew went to go stay there on his way to the coast, to the Oregon coast. Uh, I was going to meet him over there and my brother to go camping. And we'll get to that more towards the end of the video when uh, something happened when we were camping as well. So on his way to the Oregon coast, he and his wife and daughter stopped at the house. Uh, they went inside and they heard somebody walking around upstairs. Now, the second level has one bedroom on it. It was the bedroom that I grew up in. My nephew goes up there to check it out. And the door to my bedroom had been closed and was locked. The bottom of the bedroom door has this piece of paneling on it because my brother's dogs, one fourth of July, started freaking out about the fireworks and came running up there and tried clawing their way into the bedroom. Uh, so there's just this piece of paneling on there to, that's just covering that up. And my nephew thought, hey, uh, the best way to break into this bedroom would be to remove that piece of paneling. So as he's trying to take that off, from the other side of the door came up. This freaked him out a bit and thought, oh my God, there's squatters in the house. He runs back downstairs, calls 911. A few minutes later, about 20 to 30 officers show up at the house. Now, this is a small town. This is a very small town. And my, my parents' house is kind of in the outskirts. It's in the country by the, by the airport there. So anyway, they get there. They ask my nephew to draw up a floor plan of the house so they can get in there, know their way around, and be able to check every place where these people could be hiding. Then they ask my nephew and, it, and his family to wait at the end of the driveway. One of the officers starts speaking through a megaphone. We know you're in there. We have the house surrounded. Our dog will bite when he finds you. The officers that went upstairs to my old bedroom, they found the door was locked, as my nephew said. They knocked on the door. And just like what happened to my nephew from the other side, boom! Immediately, the officers drew their guns. One of them kicked the door open. 
and there was nobody in there. There was nothing that could have fallen up against the door to make a noise. They searched the rest of the house. They searched outside. And about three hours later, on their way out, they told my nephew, we didn't find anybody in there, but we don't deal with ghosts. We don't deal with ghosts. We don't deal with ghosts. And they left. So him and his wife are standing in the living room and they're debating on whether or not they actually wanted to spend the night there because it was so scary. As they were talking about this, from upstairs in my bedroom, the mirror that hung on the wall since my high school days, never been taken down before, came crashing to the ground. So this got them so freaked out that they ran outside again. Now, as they were standing outside, the garage door started to open on its own. It opened about halfway, stopped, and then closed. So they said, that is it. So they ran back inside, grabbed their things, left one light on in the living room, locked up the house, and started to leave. Now, as they were driving down the driveway, they looked back towards the house, and the one light they had left on in there turned off. I have not been to the house since this happened, uh, my brother has, and he said the only thing that he found a little disturbing was the fact that his three dogs would not go into my bedroom. Uh, this is the same bedroom where on the 4th of July, they ran up there seeking safety, and now they wouldn't go in there at all. Our story does not end there. I met my nephew and my brother over on the Oregon coast. The campground is near Fort Stevens, and I had all of my paranormal investigation equipment with me. So I was going into all the different little rooms and stuff at the fort, uh, and my EMF detector was going crazy there. Uh, there's no electricity in that place. Uh, there's not even cell phone service. I went up above to this other level I looked down and I could see my brother and my nephew and them going back inside. And so I continued to climb up. To my left, I heard the deepest guttural growl. And that's the last thing I remember. Somehow, I had fallen over the railing onto concrete on this part of my body. Uh, I ended up with multiple fractures on nine ribs. I broke my shoulder blade, my scapula, and I had a collapsed lung. I was actually airlifted to a hospital in Portland. There's so much that I don't remember about this, but I have this picture in my head of these people looking over me with a ceiling fan above them. And now I realize it was actually the helicopter propeller as I was getting loaded onto the thing. A few weeks later, my nephew sent me this picture claiming that he woke up with a pentagram scratched onto his chest. Then he told me that he and his family are scared that something has followed them back from my parents' house. Now, it, that just brings up all these memories and feelings of how I felt when I thought something attached to me and followed me back. I don't want to see the same thing happen to him. How was that for our first video? Yay! <laughs> Until next week. Boo. Hello, and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. And this is video two in our Childhood Home series. If you haven't seen the first one, I do recommend you go back and check it out. Although you don't have to watch these in any particular order necessarily. Now, since all these stories are connected to my late parents' home, I thought it would be best if I told you a little bit more about them and some of the experiences they had in the house as well. My mother passed away when I was 25. And actually, she even passed away before that. She had asthma, and she would have some really bad attacks occasionally. 
I was working on the Oregon coast in a kite shop, but there was this one day when it was really slow and all I could think of was call your mother and tell her you love her. So I picked up the phone and I called the house and there was no answer. I immediately started shaking. I knew that something had happened. I just felt it in my gut. I can't explain how I knew. I just knew. Pretty soon I got a call back from my dad. Hey Gary, I'm trying on your house phone, whether it works or not. I got the same message on this as on your other, you know, leave me a message thing. And he said, Gary, we almost lost your mother. She had passed away, but they brought her back. But then as time progressed, my mom started confiding in me with some strange things that she was dealing with. One of those was not feeling like she was in her body anymore, like she was disconnected somehow. She would get these visits by sparkly things around her that would circle around her. And there were times I would walk in on her and catch her talking to these things and being very frustrated with them and telling them to go away. There was this one day I came to their house to visit and I was driving down the driveway when I saw my mom run out of the front door and across the yard. She took me up into the kitchen where I saw all of this popcorn and popcorn kernels all over the kitchen floor. She was at the house alone making her mother's recipe for popcorn balls when from behind her, she heard somebody call her name. Dixie. She turned around and she saw her mother, who had passed away a few years before this, and herself standing behind her. And she was so relieved to hear her doctor tell her, you're not crazy. I hear this stuff all the time from people who have passed, who've been brought back. We were at my grandmother's, my dad's mother, and my mom sat with me out in their motor home and she told me, Gary, this asthma is going to kill me. Sure enough, three months later, she had another asthma attack. I knew again before even being told. But this time she had gone too long without oxygen and it put her into a coma. So three days later, she passed away again. And this time she wouldn't be coming back. Actually, about a year later, I was sitting with my dad in the living room, looking towards the stairs that go up to the to my bedroom. And he said, Gary, I saw your mom walking up those stairs. I was like, what? He said, just recently. And then he said, Gary, I'm not shitting you. And for my dad to say that, I knew he was telling me the truth. My dad ended up getting cancer and he passed away in 2014. I had edited together a video for his memorial that included this ABBA song, uh, Chikatita. It's, it was one of his favorite songs he would sing all the time. So on the two year anniversary of his memorial, I was over at their house. I was unloading some things out of his truck. And all of a sudden I heard the beginning of Chikatita playing. I was, like, I was freaked out. I was like, where is that coming from? And I realized my phone had turned on by itself. I hadn't even been playing iTunes or anything. It started playing that song on its own. Now, my first instinct was to run into the house and I stopped myself. I went back, I sat on the back end of his truck and I said, dad, if you're here, I'm just gonna sit here with you for a while. And I listened to the song all the way through. I hadn't listened to it since his memorial two years before. Then, a couple days later, I get back to my house and I'm sitting downstairs and thinking about 
what had happened when all of a sudden I felt like something was in the room with me. The only thing I could think of to do was to start recording on on my phone. And I don't even know what told me to do that, but I just, I hit record and I sat there quietly for a while. When I played it back, I heard this. Now I don't know what you hear, but I hear ABBA. Almost as if somebody was saying, this really happened. So if my dad was really using my phone to play that song, it wasn't the first time he'd used my phone because it was just a couple months after he passed that I was hanging out with a friend in LA when a FaceTime call came through on my phone and it said it was dad. I showed my friend and we looked at each other for a minute and then I didn't answer. <laughs> when I think back, I think it was my mother who saw the first apparition, shadow figure, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I was really young and she had come running into my bedroom. She shook me awake. And when I woke up, she said, oh, Gary, thank God. I thought you might have passed away. And I was like, what? <laughs> Apparently she had gone outside to get some wood pellets for the, for the stove. And as she walked in the front door, she saw through the living room to the sliding glass door that goes out onto the deck, she saw a shadow figure that was about my height. She said, oh, Gary, you scared me. That's when the shadow thing turned and went through the door. And she ran over there and grabbed the door to open it and say, Gary, get back in here. It's too cold out there. When she realized the door was locked and that whatever this was had not opened the door to go out. And it being about my height and whatnot, she thought it was me telling her goodbye and it freaked her out. I need to go back to my dad's memorial for a moment. It was soon after I had left to go back home and my brother was still there and he was sitting out front in a lawn chair talking to his sons. My brother likes to lighten up serious moments with some jokes. He had just said to his boys, something in regards to selling the house now that both parents had passed. And the minute he did so, his lawn chair buckled out underneath him and he fell over backwards. And I just can't help but think that that was dad pushing him over saying, don't you dare sell my house. So the one thing I didn't mention in the last video was that that the airport that borders my parents' property has been expanding over the years and they've taken out most of the neighbor homes. So it's only a matter of time until they expand just a little bit more and uh, take my parents' land as well. So I kind of feel like I'm on a race against time to figure some of these things out get a few more answers and be able to walk away from that place feeling okay about it. Basically, that's what this series is all about. Since next week is Thanksgiving, I won't be putting out a new video next week, but I will be over at the house. So I am going to have my investigation equipment with me. I'm going to be recording a lot over there. Hopefully, I will come back with some evidence to show you. That reminds me, it was a Thanksgiving when my mom had already passed, but my dad was still around, when in the basement on top of the TV down there, <laughs> there sat a VHS tape with writing on the spine in my mom's handwriting that said Thanksgiving 1997. She had passed away that following February of 98. When I asked my dad where it came from, 
he had no clue. It just felt, again, like one of those things that was meant to be, like it was placed there. And so I put it on and I watched the whole thing. And it was the first time I actually sat and watched video of my mother since she had passed. I felt like I had hung out with her on a holiday again. Boo! Hello and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. In the last video, I mentioned that I'd be going over to my childhood home for Thanksgiving, where I would be trying to catch some more evidence to show you this week. This is why I have the green screen. And now I'm gonna pretend like I'm watching something. It is Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving. I've got my equipment with me, so let's go. I was already tense walking into the house, so of course. Oh my God. <laughs> and here we are in my old bedroom. Now these are my closet doors and the one with a hole in it, I would always keep it plugged up because I was so afraid of something looking out of the closet at me. Let's pause right there for a moment because this night, the first night there, I sat in bed and I was thinking, what would be the scariest thing that could happen right now? The first thing that came to my head was a knock from the inside of that closet. So as I thought this, I quickly started to record audio and not five seconds into it, this happened. When we first moved into the house, my bedroom and the entire upstairs had yet to be completed. So I shared a room with my brother for a while, and this room kind of became the playroom. Uh, there was no carpet on the floor. There were no doors on the closets, just this beam in between them, and you could go around. So there were many times that I turned this room into a roller rink. But when I wasn't skating around in circles to Olivia Newton-John's physical, I was wearing a physical muscle shirt with my scrawny arms hanging out of it and making movies in that room. Like this one here, named Be Warlocked, instead of Be Witched. <laughs> if only there was YouTube in 1984! The point of me showing you this was leading into a story about how I captured my very first EVP in the house. I wanted to make a video where I interviewed myself. So I had my cassette deck and I recorded all the questions I was going to ask and then I left space in between enough time for me to answer. One of the questions, I don't remember what it was exactly, but it was a yes or no answer. So when I played the tape back, I heard this deep, no. I rushed that tape down to my mother. I played it for her and she just kind of giggled and said, Gary, how did you do that? Finally, it dawned on her that I couldn't have done this because that voice was way too deep and my voice hadn't changed yet. Before I even knew what EVPs were, I had already captured one. So around the lot here, there are many of our pets that are buried out here. Oh no, oh my God, I did not know that this dog was sitting out here. Did you see him? That just scared the crap out of me. There it is. Kathy, Tika, and a parakeet in between them uh, named Pepper. From there, we go to this back corner where most of the cats are located. I know that back here there are cats named Tuborg, Sylvester, I'll think of them. Out there in the field a little bit is my brother's dog, Buck. Two more dogs, Henry and Dash. My brother ended up coming to the house a day later than he was going to this time. One of his dogs had been hit by a car and was killed the day before. 
But that night when his dog was still missing and he didn't know that he had passed, my brother said that he felt this cold breeze come into the house when he was laying in bed. Now, his dog knew how to open up the front door with his mouth, so my brother assumed his dog was home. He then felt this weight come up on the bed and lay on him. Now, this dog was the only dog that my brother slept with. Then my brother came to the realization that he was alone in bed, and the next morning he found his dog out in the ditch in front of the house. So right up here, in that window there, is where the kitchen is. My mom loved to cook. She spent a lot of time in the kitchen. Whenever I came to the house, I would always see her in that window. One of my nephews and I, we were in the kitchen cooking, and we were talking about my mom, his grandma. We were standing by the oven when the overhead fan turned on by itself. Now look at this thing. You really have to push down on these metal switches for it to turn on. So when it turned on, my nephew and I kind of went silent. And then we looked at each other and I just reached up and I turned it off. But it really felt like my mom was saying, I hear you talking about me. I woke up around 3 a.m. and I heard a woman singing in the house. You couldn't make out the words. It was more like a humming melody. And it was traveling around the house. I got up and went to track it down. When I would catch up to the sound, it would flip and it would start coming from behind me. So I would turn around and I'd start following it the other way. I did this two or three times until it finally led me to the basement. And then that's where it stopped. The next day, my nephew came over to the house and I asked him, so have you experienced anything weird here lately? And he proceeded to tell me about a singing woman that he had heard there a few nights prior. This audio is from when I was just over there and it's him and I discussing this. Um, it's just kind of fun to hear both sides of the story. Then Percy woke up and she started looking and growling towards the basement from the couch. Towards the my, basement? Yeah. And I looked at my phone and it's 3 a.m. exactly. And she ran to the basement stairs and put her paw up. Uh, how come I didn't know this before? I told you. And not this part about going to the basement. Look, at I started shaking. <laughs> because that's when I tried to find it, when I was following it around, trying to track it down where it was yeah, coming it from. Like it's everywhere. It like led me to the basement and that's where it disappeared. And I was like, Percy, what is it? And then right when I said that, I heard a woman singing. But like, you can't hear, you couldn't hear the words. No, it, it sounds like, melody. like she was just meandering around. But she was like humming. Yes. Like, it, was, I, it wasn't it scary was, at the time. Exactly. But now that I look back on it, like... Oh it was, my God, it was the same feeling. It scares the shit out of me. Now, this conversation turned into another one about the basement. And this was something that he and I hadn't talked about before. I had gone to the house with my dog, Tabitha. And we were sitting in the basement. I was doing some writing, I think. And I thought I saw this person out the window. So I got up and I walked towards the window to take a look. And nobody was out there. That's when I heard something with claws running up beside me. Of course, I thought it was Tabitha, so I looked down to say something to her, and she wasn't there. She was still on the couch behind me. What was beside me, you couldn't see. But the carpet design was moving. So it was like there was something there that you were seeing through, and its movements were making the carpet looked like it was moving. This scent chills up my spine like nothing I had ever experienced before. I turned around to run back to the couch to where Tabitha was and time slowed down. It was like I was running through mud trying to get away from this thing until finally it's like I broke free and then I was back there with her and I grabbed her and we left the basement. This time over there, after we were talking about the singing woman, my nephew started to tell me about this experience that he had. You know what's crazy? So that same night, I went to the bottom of the stairs, you know the shuffleboard sign? Mm -hmm. The scoreboard? It was like, I could see everything else perfectly, but there was just a little section of that shuffleboard sign that looked like it was underwater. Ew. 
like waves. But when I went to go upstairs, it was like, uh, the only way I can describe it is like when you create static electricity and balloons stick to you, mm -hmm. I could feel that on the back of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it took, I remember it, like it took me so long to get to the top of the stairs. The similarities in these two stories have got me thinking. Is the basement the place where these things are coming and going? In an upcoming episode, I'm going to look into this a little bit further because one of the scariest things I have yet to tell you would fit into this perfectly. Until next time. Boom. Hello and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. I'd like to talk about attachments, negative or otherwise. If you go to a known haunted place, be prepared to the possibility of taking something home with you, which is exactly what I believe happened to me not all that long ago. Although I consider this as being connected to my parents' house, I'd like to take a break from that house for a moment and tell you about the things that happened at my house. The event that I think was the start of it all had to do with our phone. Kevin and I's landline. It would ring, you'd pick it up, and there'd be nobody there. It would do this like two or three times every day. So this one night when it did it again, I got up to answer it, I stopped, and I said to Kevin, I don't know why I'm going to answer this. It's just going to be silence on the other end. Those were my exact words. When I picked up the phone, coming through from the other end, was Simon and Garfunkel's The Sounds of Silence. We just thought, whoa, that was really weird. Then when I'd be getting ready in the bathroom upstairs, I would notice out of the corner of my eye, the toilet paper roll that would start unrolling itself slowly and then it would pick up speed and get faster and faster and faster and faster until the entire thing was on the floor. I told Kevin about this and I don't think he really believed me. It happened to me again. And I told him, and I still don't think he believed me until one day he came running down the stairs saying, Gary, it just happened to me. There was a time when my nephew was staying with us and I was talking to him in the kitchen. I was telling him about this really cool antique bar case that Kevin and I had purchased just a few days prior. And the really cool thing about this case was that if you picked it up, it started playing music. So you always knew if somebody was getting into your liquor. So as I'm telling him about this, from the dining room, it started playing music. Later, when my nephew was sleeping in the guest room, and right around 3 a.m., the bedroom door started to open. This room was filled with a lot of toys and collectibles, including this guy. And right after the door opened, out of all the things that he can say, and even though he was turned off, he said this. What do we got here tonight? What do we got here tonight? If I were my nephew, I wouldn't be staying with my uncle anymore. When my brother was visiting us once, we were sitting in the kitchen telling him about these weird things that had been happening around the house when an entire can of whole bean coffee came flying off the shelf behind us, hitting the kitchen floor, and beans went everywhere. Soon after that, we were in the kitchen talking to a friend who was staying with us, and we were specifically talking about the coffee bean experience when the broom that was propped up between the refrigerator and the cabinets came out and smacked on the floor and we all took off running out of the kitchen. <laughs> Pretty soon, we were getting woken up in the middle of the night by the stereo in the kitchen turning on by itself at full volume and it would choose to start playing in the middle of the same song every time. If you're a Robin fan, then you probably know this song. The lyrics where it would start playing are, 
I'm in the corner watching you kiss her. I'm right over here. Why can't you see me? Each time it would do this, Kevin and I would look at each other and wait for the other person to say that they were going to go down and take care of it. Most of the time it turned out to be me. I would run down the stairs, reach around the corner, grab the power cord and pull it out of the wall and immediately run back upstairs. When we moved out of that house, I was taking the last load of stuff over to our new place. And as I was pulling out of the driveway, that song started to play on the radio. I took a deep breath and I said, are you gonna follow me to this house too? And I told it that it wasn't allowed to. And so far, things have been pretty quiet at our new place. Here's a list of 10 signs to watch out for if you think you have a negative attachment. I'm going to check off the ones that I had. I'll probably never know if I actually had an attachment that came with me from my parents' house, or maybe I just moved into another haunted house, or maybe I just have these things around me all the time. And it's quite possible that I let some of them in. More about that next time. Boom. Hello and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. Before our house was ready to move into, we lived in what was called a B house. Now this is much like a duplex where there's two families in the same building, but this is all on one floor. In fact, that was ours right there. I'll never forget that in this house down in the basement, there was this red carpeted room with a picture, one of those black velvet pictures of the devil sitting on the floor, not even hanging on the wall. And it was the scariest thing to me as a kid. I absolutely hated going to that basement. I remember sitting on the living room floor when the front door opened and in came what I thought were a bunch of witches. I ran for the dining table and hid underneath as they came in and circled around the table and started reaching in for me. Now, this was probably just a nightmare. Fast forward a couple of years and we are living in our new home and I'm in my bedroom when in come what I called a bunch of army men. They did the same thing that the witches did. They surrounded my bed and they started reaching out for me. My bed was in a corner, so as they came in, I would hide between the wall and the bed, and I would end up waking up there the next morning. Then when I was in high school, I started seeing owls a lot. This one night, I was being called out to our barn. Now, it wasn't an audible come out here. <laughs> it was more of an internal feeling of I had to go out there for some reason. And I wasn't even scared at the time. I just knew I had to go out to the barn. Now, at that time, this barn was a lot smaller than that. It was the middle section it was the only part that was there and it was open on this end. So when you stood right here, you would look directly in at the bales of hay in there. And that's when I saw something moving. And this huge, huge white owl flying out right towards my head and just swooped right above me and I would go in there right now if I wasn't just a little bit too freaked out. Not long after that I had started school at the community college about 40 miles from my house. I used to act in a bunch of plays in college and this one night after a cast party I was heading home and I was on the freeway when this giant owl came out of nowhere and flew right towards the windshield of my car. I thought I might have hit it, so I pulled over really quick and looked around and there was no bird to be seen. But when I got home, I had talked to a friend that I had hung out with at the party and he was already home, so I thought, oh, he must have left soon after I did. He proceeded to tell me that I left the party a long time ago. So a trip that should have taken me 45 minutes ended up taking me about two hours and 45 minutes. Many of you already know where I'm going with this. 
Experiencers of alien abductions often report seeing owls around the same time. They also report having periods of missing time. It was kind of freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> so I just stopped thinking about it until I had this dream where I was taken aboard what seemed like a spacecraft and I was introduced to what I was told was my daughter. She had blonde hair, large green eyes. I believe that whoever created the Bratz dolls has also had a similar experience. <laughs> I was told that she was going to be fine, but she wanted to meet me. When I woke up, I just kind of laughed at myself and thought, wow, Gary, that was weird. <laughs> but then I was on a walk with my mom. It was late at night and the, the sky was filled with stars. And she had said to me, don't you wish that they would just come and take you? And I was like, what? <laughs> and that she's always wanted aliens to come take her and show her around the universe. And then she told me about this cigar shaped UFO she saw as a child uh, right out front of their house, just hovering up above. And although I thought it was kind of weird that she was telling me all this around the same time that I'd been experiencing things, I just kind of let it go until she told me about a dream she had where she was taken aboard a spaceship and she was introduced to her granddaughter who had blonde hair and large, pretty eyes. This made me very nervous. I had just been reading about how alien abductions usually happen within the family line. And even now, there are two of my nephews who make comments that make me wonder if it's carrying on. One of them, who is scared to death of the alien face, the typical large head, big eyes, and gray complexion. This is him nearly 20 years ago. Listen to what he says. Oh look, an alien. Bill Mortler. He even had a nightmare the night before he was going over to my childhood home for Christmas. He dreamt that there was an alien in the bedroom with him. He actually sat up and started talking in his sleep, saying, no, no, no. Which reminded me of a dream that I had when there was an alien in my bedroom. And I actually got up out of bed and started chasing it down, saying, I see you, I see you. And then I woke up out of it going, what am I doing? <laughs> and I went back to bed. The other nephew has seen more UFOs than he should. And he also has a lump right behind his ear like I do. And I often tease that that is our implant that the aliens keep track of us with. <laughs> I used to think that my obsession with collecting different owl items came from my mother who did the same thing. But sometimes I think, did we both start collecting these because we were seeing them a lot? <laughs> Recently, I wanted to document all of the owl experiences so I was writing them all out, and when I finished, uh, I took Tabitha out for a walk. And when we got outside, there was an owl across the street making all this noise. And I just thought, oh my god, that's weird. So we walked up the street, and when we were just about ready to turn around and walk back, I heard the owl again, directly across from us. So it had been following us up the street. So we got back to the house, we were going up the steps, and again, it started making noise from directly across the street. And then you could hear it kind of fading out. It was getting further and further away. And I just thought it was so bizarre that right after I finished writing all this out, we go outside and there's owls. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a victim of all these paranormal things happening to me. What I'm getting at is I think it's all connected from the ghosts to the aliens. Whatever all this may be, I think they're one and the same. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and... <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. When I was about 13, my mom and I were out yard sailing, which is something she liked to do practically every week. This one particular time, we came across a Ouija board. Now, I had no idea what the thing was. When we got home, we took it out of the box, and we tried using it. It took a while for it to actually start moving, but once it did, 
I was addicted to the thing. I would bring the Ouija board out whenever I could at family gatherings, uh, friends coming over after school, at lunch. In fact, I have not touched the thing since I was probably 21, 22, when I sat down to use it by myself. That's when I felt it pulling out from underneath my fingers. It was starting to move on its own. I put it back in the box and I haven't touched it since. Ever since day one of using that Ouija board, there were three spirits who always came through to talk to us. There was TG, Dubs, and Vicky. Dubs claimed to be a nine-year-old boy who had drowned. Vicky claimed that she was murdered by her boyfriend at some celebration she was having. And as for TG, when we asked him what that stood for, he said the grave, but he'd never been alive and he wasn't dead. Later on, I discovered that basically that is the definition of a demon. Now you've probably heard of a similar demon called the Zozo Demon, who seems to take over Ouija boards by going Z-O-Z-O-Z-O. Well, TG used to do the exact same thing before ever hearing about the Zozo Demon. He would take over the board when you're in the middle of a conversation with another spirit. He would take over and start spelling out TG, 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 TG. And he would just keep it up until you gave up. One time, my cousin and I were using it, and my dad and his sister came into the room. They were very skeptical about the whole thing. So my dad said, I don't want to touch the board, but I'll tell you the questions to ask and we'll see if it gets it right. And he asked, what was the very first car that I ever had? And right away it gave the answer. And I don't even remember what that answer was, but it was correct at the time. And my dad said, bullshit. So my aunt jumps in, thinking that my cousin or I knew the answer. She said, oh yeah, well, ask it who I caught him in the back seat of that car with. And when it actually spelled out the correct answer, she left the room so quick and said, that's it, I'm done. Sometime later, my parents went back to my grandmother's house and I stayed home. I threw a party and brought out the Ouija board, which we played almost the entire time. When everybody left, I went to bed and was amazed at how bright my room was because of the full moon outside. Now my bed sat on the floor so there was no real bed frame and from between the mattress and the box spring came a bouquet of blackened dead roses almost as if they were being offered to me. When I didn't take them, they slowly went back to where they came from. The next time we used the Ouija board, I asked if TG, Dubs, or Vicky had anything to do with this bouquet of roses. And Vicky admitted that it was her. I've been a bit confused lately because I remember specifically not wanting to bring that board with me in the car. I feared that I was going to have an accident or something, so I left it over at my childhood home. When I was moving from the last house I was in to the one I'm in now, I came across a Ouija board in our garage. We had no idea how it got there, and we swore we were not going to bring it to our new house. It went into the trash pile. Later, at our new house, I'm going through some stuff in the garage, and what do I come across but a Ouija board. Then, most recently, I was over at my childhood home when a niece of mine pointed over to the fireplace and said, Gary, look. And there sat the Ouija board propped up against the rock wall there. After a while of always talking to these same three spirits, when they showed up in my bedroom one day, I knew exactly who they were. It immediately brought back the memories of what I was talking about in the last video about the witches and the army men who would come into my bedroom and surround my bed. There was a tall, faceless shadow figure whose silhouette looked as if he was wearing a tuxedo. I knew immediately that that one was TG. To his left was a shorter figure wrapped in a sheet who I assumed was Dubs. And to TG's right, 
was a floating, glowing woman's head. And she had ribbons in her hair that were kind of moving as if they were in the wind, but there was no wind. This was Vicky. I believe that the three of them are still in that house somewhere. Because not once, not one single time did I ever say goodbye when I was done using the board. And that is something that is very important to do in order to close that door and keep all that stuff at bay. So, in part two of this series, when I'm over at the house, I'm going to bring that Ouija board out again. I'm going to try to contact TG, Dubs, and Vicky, and I'm going to close that door. Until then, boom! Hello, and welcome to Gary's Scary's Boonus video. And the topic that I want to discuss is going to be the controversial orbs. I know there's a lot of people out there who really firmly believe in orbs, or they pass them off as dust or bugs, whatever. Which, in most cases, that is very true. When I think about a real orb, I think of a ball of energy that creates its own light, that moves around with a purpose. Um, it has an intelligent movement. That's what I picture as being true orbs. So the first time I saw an orb, I actually saw three of them. Now this took place at my grandmother's house, uh, my father's mother, and I was laying in a sleeping bag next to my cousin, and we were sleeping in grandma's living room. And I should also add that the living room is where my grandfather passed away. So my cousin and I, we were sleeping on the living room floor in sleeping bags. I was probably around 10, maybe a little bit older. We were trying to stay awake all night long. So her and I, we would hold hands. And if we thought the other person was falling asleep, we'd squeeze it because we were going to make each other stay up all night long. Now, my grandparents, they lived on this mountain in the forest with neighbors that you couldn't even see from their place. They were so far away. And my cousin and I heard a bunch of laughter outside, uh, like somebody having a party. And just a few seconds after that started, inside came these green balls of light. And I want to say they were probably the size of a grapefruit, uh, maybe a little bit smaller. They came in, they went right above us and started circling above us like they were checking us out. We were like, do you see this? Do you see this? And they went around and probably about 15, 20 seconds later, one by one, they went up through the really old chandelier that hung in the house and they were gone. We were kind of in disbelief about it and trying to figure out what it could have been when there was no answer for it. So fast forward a little bit to when I was probably 17, 18, and I was visiting my grandmother uh, and I brought a friend with me. And her and I were sleeping in the same spot that I was sleeping with my cousin on the floor in sleeping bags in the living room. And I started to tell her that story. We suddenly heard laughter coming from outside. And I was like, that's what I was talking about. And then it stopped. And then in came the three lights hovering above us. And I elbowed her. I was like, this is exactly what I was talking about. Do you see this? And she closed her eyes and she said, yes, I see them, but I don't want to. And I was like, open your eyes. You have to watch this. And just like before, one by one, they went whoo, 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 up into that old antique chandelier. Then later on in life, when I started hearing about orbs, I was always out to catch one on video. And so that's when I kind of started to figure out what was dust, what was bugs, and what had no explanation. So now I'm going to show you three videos that I took. These are three different videos of orbs that they're not as big as what I saw at my grandmother's but they behave differently than I have seen most dust or bugs 
behave. Each of these videos are numbered one, two, and three so that those of you who want to comment on them or give your opinion on what you think they are, you can refer to the number uh, in the comments below. I would love that actually, if you shared your opinion on what these are. I should also mention that these three videos were all taken at my house. Number one. It appears to come into the room between the ceiling and the wall, and then comes at the camera. <laughs> Number two. This one comes in seems to change its mind, stop, turn around, and fly back towards the camera. Number three. It appears to come from the fireplace and start checking things out. As it gets closer to me, it shoots past the camera. That's when Tabitha noticed it. With the first one and the third one, you may even think that I had a little flashlight shining it around because they are definitely creating some form of light. I promise you I did not have a flashlight in my hand of any kind. <laughs> so that's my story on orbs. Boo! Hello and welcome to Gary's Scaries. I am Gary. My grandma on my mother's side, I remember as a kid, she always said that 80 was going to be enough for her. And when she got cancer, she was 79. And I remember the day she turned 80. And although she wasn't saying much or doing much at that time, um, just knowing that she was okay checking out at 80, and that's what was happening. It made it a little bit better. I know it's it's never easy, but just that memory of what she had said, it, it did help a little bit. Before she passed, she would talk about people who had passed already coming into the bedroom. And you'd catch her reaching out, and she'd say that she was reaching for this light in the room. And some of that is, you know, the typical stuff that you hear about when someone passes away, about seeing a light um, and their loved ones who have already passed. My grandparents on my dad's side had lost a daughter very young in life. And my grandfather passed back in the 1980s. Uh, he and my grandmother, they had a few years in between them. He was a bit older than her. He passed of cancer and he was in a, a bed in the living room for a long time. And right before he passed, he kept telling my grandmother that somebody was knocking at the door. This was after a period of time when he wasn't talking much at all. He mainly just slept. She told him, there's nobody at the door, but he insisted that somebody was. And later that day, he passed. I remember being over at my grandma's sister's house. And my grandma and my dad were out in the garage talking, and I was just kind of hanging out in the background, um, eavesdropping on the <laughs> conversation. And I remember my grandma telling my dad, you know, your dad has come to me before. She said that he came to her in the middle of the night with their daughter who had passed, and he asked her if she would come with them. And my grandma said, no, she wasn't ready yet. And then he left. When she eventually did pass, it, it helped remembering that and knowing that my grandpa was probably right there. She went probably the way that all of us would like to go. She just went to take a nap one day and she didn't wake up. When I make these videos and I share these stories, I'm not 100% behind 
the fact that these could be ghosts or spirits or the alien thing. And I just feel like there is so much going on around us that we can't see, that, that our limited senses that we have can't pick up on. And I wonder if those other things are able to pick up on us. And that sixth sense that you hear about, I truly believe that it exists because I've felt it and it's right here. So trust your gut. And if you feel like a loved one is around, they probably are. Until next time. Now as for Haunted Childhood Home Part 2, my return, shooting has begun. I've already captured a couple of things that I'm excited to share with you and get your opinions on. Here's a little taste of what's to come. Take a look. When I first arrived at the house, not only was I greeted by Christmas decorations that hadn't been taken down yet, but I was also met by this peculiar sound coming from inside. Do you hear that? Oh my god. There's been a few times when I've noticed my dad's urn slightly ajar. And what added to the creep factor when I first got there was the instant that I put the lid back on the urn, my camera shut down. And your dad's ashes open. I just put the lid back on dad's ashes and the camera turned off. On my first night there, I was just beginning to do a dark walkthrough of the house and I decided to ask, is it okay if I stay here for a while? So my arm just started burning and swelling in spots. Now I just may be getting too freaked out on my own and my eyes might be playing tricks on me, but I see the answer to my question in this burn. Is it okay if I stay here for a while? No, you may not. Oh. And that about wraps it up for tonight. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit that notification bell so that you'll know exactly when series two is uploaded. Until then.